The heat of the day and the tension had built up. That thumb on the hammer of the pistol held against the head of Joyce Powers slipped. And she was dead. Within seconds, the commandos knew what to do. Their best sniper put a bullet straight into the skull of the driver. When you cross people of that magnitude, of the DEA, the United States, everyone is cursed. When I handed over my passport at the check-in, she looked at it, then referred to a list she had next to it. I knew it was all over. What is the etiquette for being in a cell of despair and hopelessness when your cellmate has clearly decided to kill himself? I knew that at a certain point I'd be sentenced to death and I'd be on death row for a while. Whether I'd be executed or not didn't really bother me so much because, it, as I say, it was machine gun. So accept the idea of spending years on appeals and which would go nowhere and ultimately the rest of my miserable existence in, in this prison. It's meant coming, getting out of the cell in the middle of the night, getting to the ground without making a noise because it was a cell full of trustees who'd blow their little whistles out if they saw us. Get to the ground, get to my office, get some more equipment and start heading over these internal walls to get to the outer one, which had electricity running across the top. And it was very tall. When you come to a point, it has to be now or never. I looked out of the window that night and the guard that I particularly didn't want to be asleep under the window, he wasn't on duty. It was time to go. Hi guys and welcome back to KRN TV where we bring you the most exciting interviews from around the world. Today delighted to be back with David McMillan. Hi there. For those who don't know, David's got the most insane story that takes him literally all around the world. Started in Australia, took him to Thailand, India, Afghanistan, South America, Pakistan, in literally everywhere and unfortunately he saw a few jails along the way. Um, here's the definition of an international drug trafficker. Well, that's an introduction there, Christian, isn't it? I think uh, last time I was speaking to you, uh, I'd finished off a massive prison sentence that I'd managed to get in Australia. And it was a tough one. I'd been in supermax sections of it. Uh, everything had been stripped away. I mean, not just property, of course, and things and money, but lives as well. My wife had been killed early on in a prison fire. So when I got out, it was really, not really like a clean slate, but a, like not even a slate there at all. But as I'd mentioned, uh, I found police all over me. And they admitted they, they found it kind of enjoyable chasing me around, but honestly, I think they, it was just easy to get funded. Um, really, if scallywags are thinking whether they're being followed by police, they really just have to look at the economics of it. Are they, do they appear to be somebody worth funding for it? Well, I must have been, so I left. I said goodbye to Australia forever, and I was heading for Europe. And I needed to pick up some money in Thailand because everything else was gone. My old pal that I dragged out of the slums of the old Metro Hotel in Sukhumvit Road, he, I'd, well, I'd given him a big bag of money to use. I think he's built a shopping centre or something. But I hadn't spoken to him for well, 10 years, longer. And, and it was one of those, I mean, there were a couple of great feelings landing there. Nobody knew who I was. I'd gone to a lot of trouble to get the passports that I had. I had a main one and a backup one from New Zealand. And a 
felt free, really, for the first time when I was walking in the streets in Bangkok. And it was still, I mean, when was this? This was 1993, so it wasn't quite as glitzy and modern uh, as it would be today. Though, of course, with COVID, it's a bit of a ghost town in some ways. But <clears throat> also, when I saw my old friend Lee there, it was as though it was yesterday. You know, he was pleased to see me back. Uh, even, I'd, I'd forgotten his address, but it's strange, you can find people when you really want to. I went to what I thought was the area and described the man, and next minute I was there. He pulled up some money, pretty much straight away. Now the plan was to keep on going immediately, but I wasn't used to the sense of freedom at all. This was an alien feeling. Since 19 years old, I'd been running little operations or bigger ones later on, but having to hide, having to conceal who I was, being aware of a police task force operation in the later stages. So this was, in a sense, the first real freedom I've had. I, I was kind of reluctant to let it go, so I, I put aside some of the planning and stayed extra time. Now, <clears throat> I'm a person who's made every possible mistake that can be made, so be very careful putting aside your um, carefully thought out plans and itinerary. Okay, you've got to be adaptable, but I, I wasn't myself, I was a free man, that's not something I was used to being. And of course, bad things happened from it. One of the other contacts I'd had, uh, not my old friend Lee, but what would you call him? Oh, international travelling salesman, he used to get his dope packed in cutlery boxes. You wouldn't want to be running around with them today, but... Uh, in those days, they were kind of unique and looked like a gift box kind of thing. And he'd made himself a fortune, but here's the thing. He wasn't just some Chiang Mai middleman. He was the nephew of one of the Mr. Bigs over there. There was about four major players in the Golden Triangle. Kun Sa across from Burma, General Lee, and this man. Now... I'll just call him the uncle, not because his identity matters, it's just a very long and tangled name. He had run afoul of the US DEA and ended up dead himself. Why? Because he absolutely crossed the line with them. The uncle of one of my Thailand connections <clears throat> He had tried to warn off a DEA agent who um, was based mostly in Bangkok, but had a field office in Chiang Mai, and that's, um, um, well, it's about 250,000 people, a town up in the north, and it was notorious for being um, the big trading post for all the uh, Burmese opium, heroin, pills that they'd make. He was being investigated by the American DEA, but they do that with a light touch. They, they stay in their office, they get field reports, they don't go out like James Bond groping around. Now this man, uh, this DEA agent, had been warned a couple of times not to stray off the path, but he went out to see... Um, a village headman in an opium growing district and started asking questions. I mean, ridiculously, can you imagine uh, a village man telling a, a foreigner, telling anybody, oh yes, I, I sell my opium to uh, this man or that man. It doesn't work that way anyway in Thailand. In, when, if somebody, say a trader up there, a middleman, wholesaler, if he wants, I don't know, uh, 10 kilos of heroin, he'll order it. So he'll arrange for the opium paste 
um, to be gathered together in one area, perhaps a village or a town or a network, and then make a separate arrangement with the laboratory guys who are all independents. Now, when they talk about Kunsar and uh, General Lee and other big players there, they don't do anything. It's not like the movies where you see some big cheese sitting on a carved wooden throne as uh, workers toil away on steaming vats. They've got nothing to do with it. They're like the overlord government. They just tax everybody. They tax the transport, they tax the laboratories, they take a cut from the farmers, and the farmers don't make very much. But the guy in the middle, he, he can do quite well. But my contact, Tommy's uncle, liked to do lots of things himself. He'd narrowly got out of a, a being stopped with his driver with, I think, 400 kilos of uh, heroin, all bagged up, um, and that was in a Volvo. It, of course, the, he was found guilty in the first court and then won on appeal. Now, there was a lot of pressure to try and well, the reason the DA didn't like this guy very much was that he was known to be the man who introduced heroin to the U.S. servicemen when they came over from Vietnam. And you can imagine, out of all the things in the world you could be, uh, a dealer in plutonium, uh, a spy, a slave trader, I think to be known as the man who brought addictive heroin to the soldiers of the United States would not be a good thing. And it was certainly enough for this uh, field agent. His name was Mike Powers, I was trying to think of it, yeah. So, what to do? Uncle wanted to make sure Mike Powers did like every other person and sat in his office and did nothing really except get reports. But the way he went about it was a bit extreme. He arranged to have snatched from the street this Mike Powers wife, and she used to take the kids down to the uh, part of the American school there, but this was for uh, at primary grades. So the nanny, uh, Joyce Powers, and the kids were all grabbed in a white VW combi van and driven off. The idea was drive them around town for a couple of hours, let them go, that'd be enough to scare the husband. Well, I don't know what it is about criminals and the cars they uh, pick to do a job, but you'd think you'd want something where the engine wasn't likely to break down. But if you don't think you'll get paying and getting paid enough, I suppose you would try and get a, a cheap car, and this one broke down at an intersection. And a policeman happened along. And the traffic cop looked inside and thought, this isn't right. Um, I guess it wouldn't have looked right. Terrified nanny, uh, sputtering something or other. Um, Joyce Powers being quiet, so I'm told. The kids looking for assurance everywhere, because the driver, the kidnapper, and his assistant were um, you know, trying to keep them calm and being all nice. And Well, I suppose there'd be quite a few people watching this who would have known that smiles in uh, Thailand don't necessarily mean a good outcome. The, uh, the land of a thousand smiles, is it? Mm, at least that. Well, the traffic cop uh, wasn't going to have any of this, but before he could do anything, um, one of the guys in the van shot him. Now that's going to get attention, especially from a car that's not moving anywhere. It moved a little bit before breaking down again. The kidnappers very quickly let the nanny go and the kids, they didn't want to get them involved and they scurried away, but it was jammed up at another intersection. Now, um, I should say that uh, the policeman who was shot was uh, didn't go out quietly. He'd um, put a bullet into the, the assistant in the van there, uh, who was otherwise occupied by dying at that intersection. 
And the gunman thought the only way he's going to keep himself alive is to hold his pistol and he tore some of the wiring out from the bottom of the car and twisted it around the, the trigger of the pistol and then held the hammer back while keeping it aimed at uh, Joyce Powers' head. There was the standoff. The Americans, of course, pulled in any favour they might have and made some threats and told the generals, we want this man alive, alive he must be. Uh, of course, the wife had to be freed. Not an easy dual thing to do. Whereas uncle had his own arrangements. He had army friends too. He had people in the special commando team that was brought down to keep an eye on them. There was some hope of, uh, I think there was a TV monk, some famous personality who had agreed to swap places. But none of that was going to happen. Especially after a few hours when they're all surrounded, some sort of negotiations are underway, but the uncle's given instructions. And before nothing else can happen, the heat of the day and the tension had built up. That thumb on the hammer of the pistol held against the head of Joyce Powers slipped, and she was dead. Within seconds, the commanders knew what to do. Their best sniper put a bullet straight into the skull of the driver. Infuriated uh, Americans knew there was something up, but there was no evidence. So they arranged that uh, uncle would be killed. They got to his crew, his driver. He was driving somewhere, there was a flat tire. Uncle got out to investigate. A huge truck came over a hill and smashed into him. No more uncle. So you'd think this was problem solved, vengeance taken by both sides. No, no. When you cross people of that magnitude, of the DEA, the United States, everyone is cursed like some historic family curse down the generations. All those who know them are tainted. I knew none of this. I hadn't heard any of this story. So when the nephew, Tommy, when he was trying to get in touch with me, I saw no reason not to. This was years before. Why should it go on? And yet it did. So, I was still being careful. He was supposed to make his phone calls in a certain way. I was meant to ring him not at his office. But he knew um, what my travelling name was and what hotel I was at. And within breaking every rule in the book, he rang straight from his office to my hotel. That was it. I was finished. I didn't know I was finished, but I was. I only knew that when I went to continue my journey, went to the airport, went to check in. And if you've been traveling for years and, and smuggling and dependent on how people treat you and the people who work with you at airports, you're very tuned in to any disturbance from the usual. When I handed over my passport at the check-in, she looked at it, and then referred to a list she had next to her, a piece of paper, looked back at it, and then she changed. She said she'd have to just check something she wasn't sure of. See, the thing is, the name on the list was different. I'd switched passports, but all the, the flight number matched the other details. It was still an Australian passport. But I knew it was all over. I had to back into the crowd. Um, now, if you have to get away from an airport and you're at check-in, um, you really can't go back on the same level that you're at. You have to go downstairs to arrivals. That's where the taxis are. That's your getaway point. So I took the stairs. I only had hand luggage. 
I ran down, grabbed a taxi, took it into town, changed to, to, to went through a department store, went to a hotel, uh, took a, a motorbike taxi through the very clogged streets, made a couple of phone calls. I did ring Tommy to tell him that, look, your phones are tapped, you're in trouble. And I thought, well, if his phones are tapped, they're going to swallow this next one. I said, I'll take the trains down and cross over into Malaysia. That should keep them quiet. What I didn't know that his next call was to a travel agency that, uh, well, we didn't use it, but we had friends there. It was a place to go to make phone calls or to make arrangements in an emergency. As I went there, those little signs I missed. After all, I've had all those years trading blows with a mostly unseen enemy, major imprisonment, only, only a sense of freedom for perhaps three days. And then suddenly all that's taken away. That identity at the airport is blown. Everything that follows from that is blown. My travel, my tickets, all gone. Everything I'll have to change. Perhaps if I hadn't been so overwhelmed by that, I might have seen the pile of cigarette butts in the arcade as I walked into the travel agency, meaning that somebody had been standing there waiting, smoking, crushing butts. But I wasn't in there more than a few minutes before uh, plainclothes Thai police came in and the way they reported, I didn't say anything and I seemed short of breath. I guess I was because just didn't seem to be any point in breathing. Everything was, I mean, I knew what was going to happen. Uh, and there was no buying my way out of it. Because if it was these people, it was the agencies. If it was the agencies, no, no cop would take my money. I'd be poisoned. And sure enough, I found myself in the Chinatown police station uh, lockup there. Probably, I guess, one of the most depressing um, places in the world. Um, you know, Christian, I, I asked somebody once uh, who'd been around a bit, what's the most horrible cell you've ever been? Now, if you're imagining somebody's going to say, well, I was in a dungeon somewhere in Lagos, I suppose that might count. But there has to be something else to make it particularly awful. And this guy said to me, it's the, when, if you've been arrested for something in the UK or, or the US, they put you, you're going to court, and if it's big enough, you're not going anywhere. You're going to be refused bail or it'll be set high or, or something from. And this holding cell in the UK, it's the magistrate's court um, where people get remanded. In that holding cell, it's so depressing because you and perhaps one or two others will be the last and still be there. Many will come. They'll pay their fines. They'll go up for sentencing. They'll be released on bonds. Others will be taken in for some outstanding warrant and that'll be settled. You'll watch as this overcrowded, bustling, spitting, urine-smelling, horrible little holding cell fills up and then drains away. You'll see people banging the walls and tearing at their hair because they've got, what, three months they might have to do. But at the end, there's just a few of you standing there. I, I knew what my friend meant. It is because there's hopelessness there. You're the one that's not going anywhere. And that was the same, really, in the Chinatown lockup police station. It was part of the, I think, anti-narcotics force uh, headquarters. It was virtually underground. There was no window except for a little grill, at, which must, must have been at footpath level because it was all caked with dust and oil from passing cars. You could hear the sounds of street. You could sort of know when it was day, but there was hardly any light came through there. Oh, it was three days before Christmas, I should add, too. So my companions in that 
horrible little place where uh, there was a group of seven Chinese who knew their way around. Six of them would be released and one, it would be negotiated, would take the rap. They bought me a horrible but nice, I guess, Christmas cake. All creamy and gooey from some street shop nearby. I had a... Where was he from? I think he was a Nigerian guy on a Ghanaian passport um, who'd been sent to Thailand to see that some water coolers were sent on. Uh, they were full of dope. He'd been arrested. It was known. I knew that his life was over from there because I knew that he would be given 40 or 50 years, that he would serve perhaps 25, that being Nigerian there was no prisoner exchange, there was no way out. Even when his sentence finished, there was no embassy there, he couldn't get documents to travel again. He was finished, he was at the mercy of the big groups amongst them who, <laughs> who, would I say visit and feed and help? No, they don't, they exploit the 700 odd prisoners in the big jail there, which I had yet to see. There was F Swiss Freddy next to me. He wasn't very talkative because he'd swallowed 100, 100 and something Rohypnol pills, hoping to kill himself. He'd been, he'd served a little bit of time for a theft of a TV in Bangkok once before, but he was a drifter, like most of the couriers that get busted there. They, they almost know each other. They work for, well the foolish ones will work for the Nigerian syndicate and you have to have your timing right there. Not only to get paid but to survive because on your fourth or fifth run they'll turn you in. It's part of the deal. But he was working for a Pakistani group and the passport they got him for the run was a bad one. He said to me, Daniel, that was my main name there, though I was soon enough David amongst friends again. He said, David, the passport was no good. I knew it was no good. It didn't look good. In fact, the passport that he'd been supplied with to travel was... Uh, had been sold by somebody who had to sell it because he was wanted, he couldn't use it himself. So he was stopped at the airport for some visa violation and they found the drugs and his life was over too. But not quite as over as uh, the poor African guy. But Freddie had had enough. No, by the way, the fistful of Rohypnol didn't kill him. He. Um, I mean, what is the etiquette for being in a cell of despair and hopelessness when your cellmate has clearly decided to kill himself and you can't think of any damn reason to wake him up and say you were wrong? <laughs> because there isn't one. You might wake him up to say if you've got any more of those pills uh, because that's the way I felt myself. Yeah, he kind of came to after two days, crawled over to get some water to the toilet and wobbled around for the next day because his legs were all like rubber. But I found out later that if you're going to kill yourself, that they just won't do it. Um, somebody who belonged to something called the Suicide Society who straightened me out on the, the correct application of the uh, bin liner and tape that you managed to get on there after you've taken the pills. But still. Uh, so real quick, let's pause you just for a second. Mm. So you know, obviously, when they grabbed you, they stumbled upon, obviously, these two fake passports. But what was their reason for grabbing you, obviously? We know it's because you've gone to the... Or what was their charge that they said that they were grabbing you for? The um, initial one was false passport. Oh, is that because they... They said they'd stumbled at the airport, they knew it was a false passport they were saying there, so they were trying to nick you they'd from be, there, or were been, they going to nick you They'd been told, it was, there was a kind of conversation between the USDA, the Australians, and um, the Thais, among, should um, they let me go with this passport or not. Um, 
there were there were some who were in favour of letting me go and keep travelling um, because it was clear that I, whatever I was up to, the main business hadn't been concluded or arranged. In fact, I, I didn't have any, I was just collecting money. But um, it was too late for that. Uh, I didn't stay around long enough to find out. But within, after another bit of discussion, the next day, I was charged with um, having drugs at the airport. Now, I mean, I'll admit to kilos that uh, I've had, but often as not as the things you didn't have, um, the things you didn't arrange that come to do the most harm. Everybody wanted me taken out of the picture. I'd been as useful as I could be to them in as much as they hung a major series of arrests on me a decade earlier. They tested out their telephone equipment on me in, in Bangkok while I was there. It was quite new. They, they, the uh, DEA with the uh, NSA had, had supplied equipment for their telephone system and were able to get into it. And it was just interesting to them to um, chase me around, especially because when the Australians were asked, uh, or were told that, oh, he's in Thailand, they didn't believe it because I'd taken a, I'd made arrangements with my business partner and friend, Michael. I left my mobile phone with him and a tape recording. He went to a payphone, rang my mobile phone and played the tape, which was he and I talking. Um, and so when they recorded that, it was based on Melbourne telephones. So they, they were convinced that I was hiding out a bit, but that I was still around. So I only mention this because it makes it an interesting sort of job to trace somebody who's taking precautions. You learn more if you're a, an investigator. But I, I was no longer useful. So as they do every day at the airport, when they do their sweep, amongst all the things that had dropped from pockets and bits of hash and pills and things that nervous couriers dump in the toilet. There was a, um, a little packet of a suspiciously perfect amount for their purposes of about 60 grams of heroin. At the airport, that's enough for the death sentence. So I was charged with that too. Um, they took their time in finding a way of uh, connecting it with me, but um, they eventually found a policeman to say, oh, he, uh, he when he fled the airport, he, he dropped it. Um, it doesn't really matter in a, in a, a Thai court. Um, Thai courts are an interesting bit of... Uh, I shouldn't really be condescending to put it this way, but it struck me this way at the time. Imagine if your uh, your eight and nine year old kids decided to play courtrooms in the living room, and one dressed up as the judge and and the others played different roles. That that's pretty much how it works, except uh, your kids can't send, sentence somebody to death by machine gun, which they can in Thailand. The, the court appearances. Oh, I was after a week of of nothingness. I was taken out to the biggest uh, remand prison in the country, really the biggest prison. It's called many names. <laughs> um, Tlong Prem, La Jiao, uh, Bangkok Hilton by some, though that should really be applied to Bang Kwan, um, the big tiger. This was huge. It, you can see it from space, not that there was Google Earth back then, but it, it was massive. How many, how many inmates would it have in that prison? Well, there were 10 or 12 sub-prisons within it. There was a women's prison. All of these things, if people, um, I think if they can probably get onto Google Earth and, and type in um, Klong Prem. K L O N G P R E M, and it'll come up pretty quickly. You see this huge square. It was 
very big when it was built and it was enlarged during the Second World War when the Japanese had needed more space. And it holds probably around 11,000 people. It's a city. Within those subsections are uh, the drug remand prison, which is crazy in its own way. It's um, the sentence prisoner section, which is better, because it's more settled. People get into their ways. You can have cash in your pockets. It's not legal, but it's not absolutely uh, outlawed like it is in the drug remand section, which I was there for a while. That, I could never understand the name of that exactly, but it translates something like the cure. And when you first go in there, it seems so quiet because everybody's locked up. The, uh, everybody's naked, squatting. Uh, the reception guards are having their trustees. It all it used to run completely on trustee system there. Those prisoners who do their, the officers bidding, their, they have their own kind of uniforms. They have their own batons. They do the locking and unlocking. They do the punishments. They sell the drugs Tuesday, arrest everybody for drugs on Wednesday. They make sure that the guard is comfortable, he has his ice chest brought to him, his drinks, and that uh, they do the recruiting for the factories to make sure that that factory makes enough money for the guard's own pocket and the building chief's cut as well. So it's like the prison officers have got a good little uh, hustle going on in there. They, they, do, they like their lives. Um, there's a... I suppose there's a bit of a contrast around the world of what... Uh, now, the, in this place, the guards had their flats and houses on the outside of the building. So I suppose if you even got out, uh, all you'd run into is a, a warren, a maze of um, little um, bungalows and, and flats and things that belonged to prison guards because uh, thousands of them um, lived there. But, um, so when you come in after uh, having uh, any bars of soap, you've got kapoo and anything else that's liquid squeezed out onto an old newspaper so you can take it away. Um, they, they, they had some characters there. The, the, the skull, who was the one who receives the new prisoners, would have a long cane and he would welcome back old faces that he'd seen in the past. He'd make witticisms to his trustees as he swiped at them. Oh, Poon Tang, you're back again, I see. You must love this place. He loves this place, boys, doesn't he? And his trustees would collapse about laughing as though this man was the wittiest prison officer in creation. Uh, and then this poor little bastard would get swiped with the cane and battered and say thank you. I said it had only been eight months since you've been released from, and so it was a heart, heartbreaking moment for you, like I said, you weren't committing. No, I, I thought, if I'd gone to so much trouble to stay safe, I'd set up a phone call with Michael so that anybody listening to my phone would know I hadn't moved. The passports, I can't tell you how much trouble I went to make sure I was not being followed as those were obtained. Um, and uh, the ticketing, the same, I took. I was so intensely concentrating on checking whether I was being followed, I saw people in a new light, the, the people on the train. I noticed people who were changing car carriages without a reason, others who were nervous and got off, interactions between passengers that I'd never noticed before because I wasn't going to let anything go unobserved. Uh, I thought I was being followed by one guy who kept going into different office buildings, but it wasn't. He was just a a lonely old pensioner who fantasised about having a business and having an office and used to visit different floors of different buildings. Yeah, unfortunately, when you're looking for something and a bit paranoid, so you're always sort of seizing... Oh, I'm glad I didn't have a kind of snifter of anything going. I would have been convinced I was... Uh, and uh, but, real quickly, your yeah. end destination, you're planning on just stopping off, do a pit stop in Thailand and then going to England, is that correct? That was the plan. Starting a new life in England, obviously, yes. from yeah. Australia. I, I, I didn't... I didn't want to be in the game any longer. I had probably about a half a million scattered about that would be enough. Considerable money in 1993. Yeah, um, and I really 
you know, I've never... When I was very young, I liked the money because it looked good all stacked there on the coffee table, but I, I didn't have any great um, desire to hoard it or, or to buy anything or be a controller of things. I, uh, the crossing borders was really the challenge of trying to do it. It was kind of depressing in a way when the mission would succeed because is that all there is to it? And I didn't like to get rid of the stuff either. I didn't like the perfectly good, shiny, mother-of-pearl coat going to grubby hands who would then... I gave something to somebody once and he said, oh, can I use this, this flat? I thought, well, for a couple of hours, I guess you can. Next minute he's got a guy in there with a press and he's getting all this shit. I said, are you crazy? That's perfectly good. What are you doing to it? Just let it go out as it is. You'll still make plenty. It'll be premium, you know. I'm trying to protect my little child that I've nursemaided across two continents and taken care of, and some pig is just going to wreck it. Uh, no, it was it was depressing in that way. No, I was heading to a different life. I don't know what it would have brought. Who knows? Maybe I would have got bored and got up to some mischief. I always wanted to steal the uh, Shah of Persia's crown jewels. Uh, ever since Khomeini took over in Iran. That was probably a pipe dream. It's still there, by the way. You're not busy. Um, <laughs> not very interested to me. Maybe one of the viewers might uh, yeah. pack their ears. Okay. Uh, I do need a couple of Farsi speakers, by the way, people. Uh, the link's in the cons description box. I get quite a bit of uh, mail from people with um, interesting ideas. Mm. But mostly with personal problems, oddly enough. You know, how do I deal with such and such and come on top in the office and all of that? I can imagine the situations you've been in in your life, there's not many people who have been in worse uh, places at, at certain times and uh, you've overcome it all, so... Well, you do have to get better after making a lot of mistakes at reading people in the sense that will this person do what I ask of him? Um, because ultimately that's the question, isn't it, for everyone in every human exchange is will, it, I mean, some people who have vanity ask, will this person believe I am what I'm presenting myself to be? But honestly, who gives a shit? Who's got time to worry about that kind of stuff? What you really want to know is, uh, do I like this person around me? Uh, will I get cooperation? And... Will I get fed and a warm place to sleep? <laughs> so I would have been quite happy somewhere else, but I was busy trying to figure out how to kill myself. Swiss Freddy had the right idea there. But... Uh, yes, and, you'd mentioned previously, you know, um, mm. in the holding sort of prison, uh, police station, yeah. that's the best place in order to sort of stock up prior to going to the prison. Yes, that's right. Unfortunately, you weren't in the sort of greatest mind state. And so rather than thinking about supplies, you're thinking about... No, no, I made it Previously, you mentioned uh, sleeping tablets were on your mind. And... I did ask, uh, I'd met a guy there who was a bit of an old player, a young guy, about 30, I suppose. And he said, look, we're in the best place now. Do whatever you have to do. Uh, get whatever you need to have in. The police don't care. My wife is coming in. Ask her for anything you need. And I did ask her for a fistful of sleeping pills, but she was no fool. If she had six kids, I think she'd uh, worked a bit. And uh, she thought to herself, no, no, I don't think I'll go along with that one, made some excuse. Um, perhaps just as well, I wouldn't be here telling this story. But even in the prison after I got there, I had still enough faculties to avoid getting the... Um, 24-7 chains. They put chains on you if your case is over, I forget what it was, over um, 20 grams. So I tore up all my court papers and wrote 16.5 um, grams on the back of a lawyer's business card. So I could act a dumb foreign visitor, you know, down. What? what's your case, your papers? I, I don't know about this, that's all I know. Oh no, he's, he's here. Oh, you know what they said? I alert later that was they said. Oh, just more white trash. He's on some shit case or something like that. So, uh, all, all my uh, other Western friends were all rattling around in chains after that, but uh, managed to get out of that for that time. 
Um, so what's the cell situation when you arrived at the, the main prison? How many people are in the cell? First night cell, um, about 60 in a cell that would hold um, 16. And you're packed in there, and you get a long speech by the um, room head trustee. Uh, and he has a little square of uh, polished linoleum in the corner with his own two servants. And they do the laughing at his jokes. And he makes the same speech to every uh, new bunch who come in. All right, we might not let translate something like a sergeant major's speech. You know, I can't tolerate the smell of piss in the place. So try and hold your water. But if you have to go over there, but don't make any noise after twelve o'clock. All of that. Oh, and don't even think about number twos. None of that goes on here. Um, <coughs> and. He will send somebody over to offer you drugs, and if you're stupid enough to even blink an eye in response, then your dance card is marked after that. Um, they just want to find out early. And you even get that in the so-called medical check the next day. But I imagine there'd be some... I was still naive in a way. I thought there'd be some enclave of well-heeled... Um, foreigners who, uh, for whatever reason, still got stuck there, but at least had used their money to, to build some haven. Nothing of the kind. Nobody was in there except what the... Well, I think the guy was right, white trash. Um, the people that had screwed up everywhere around the world, turned on their family and friends, had no one willing to do anything, got tangled up in um, taking the first offer, and they knew these offers were no good. They knew the groups wouldn't serve them well. They'd be lucky to be paid, lucky not to get arrested. But there was even a, a, there was a Portuguese guy who'd been arrested on the fourth run that he'd made. He worked for uh, the Nigerian syndicate who worked hand in glove with the uh, USDEA. They let them go on. I mean, strange thing was, when these couriers would be arrested by the ties, by arrangement, at the airport, they would tell the same story. Uh, Joe's guest house, um, this is where my tickets came from, that travel agency. Nothing happens to Joe. Don't go to the guest house, because that was part of the deal. The Portuguese one had actually been ratted out, but it was a busy day and the police hadn't thought to arrest him. So he got through the airport, got all the way to Malaysia, and that's a country they'd execute for real. They've got a special island where they shoot people there. Anyway, and there was nobody there to meet him because he's supposed to be under arrest. He rings back to Bangkok, his Joe at the guest house, said, well, there's nobody here. Huh? What are you doing? Oh. <laughs> uh, they tell him to f get on another plane with the staff, fly back to Bangkok. When he arrives in Bangkok, then they arrest him. Because they rang up, the Americans rang up the ties and said, look, you lazy bastard, you were supposed to arrest that guy going out. Well, too late now. No, no, no. All of this, they're good guys, our Nigerian friends, they're sending him back for us. So, uh, I don't think I would have done that. I think I would have smelt a rat and stayed in Malaysia or flown off anywhere other than that. Poor guy. Now, these people would get routinely... Um, between 40 and 50 years to life. Um, the way the court works is that you can go through all the evidence hearing. It's, it's a session of two hours once every six to eight weeks. So eventually as the years go past it comes to an end and you can then plead guilty. If you plead guilty the death sentence is taken to life but they'll usually to encourage that, they'll bring in a figure of years, um, 40 or 50 or something. If you're the lowest, the minimum is 25, but that's, uh, you don't get that very often. And it's the same as a murder case there. Um, sometimes multiple murders end up with a death sentence. And at the time I was there, the penalty was carried out by machine gun. Um, and you were strapped to a, a board and um, uh, the three pieces of string attached to the 
machine gun trigger and, and different prison officers had pulled the string. But apparently they found some guy who was ultra keen and was quite happy to do it himself. He's even written a biography of sorts. Um, uh, they have lethal injection these days, so is that better? I don't know. But the worst part is waiting for it to happen, the idea of being on death row. And I, I'd spoken to people on death row there. Um, they've been there years, they get chained to a wall at night, um, they have to pay like $20 just to take a shower, they really get drained of everything um, in that place. But I had, um, by the time I finished wanting to escape and then go and kill myself, even after escaping, I just plain I wanted to escape in the end. I was given hope by a, an American con man who I knew he was tricking me and wanted me to arrange money for him. He was getting out. I, you know, he was only doing a year on some nonsense. Um, a few grams of something. But. Really, people said, look, you were being tricked by this guy. You were in this prison. He was promising you he'd fix up bail. He'd arrange a medical uh, report so he'd have to be released. The drugs would go missing. The police would be... But none of it was true. And people said later, but didn't you ever want to hunt him down afterwards? After all, he had contacted family and friends and milked them of about 50,000, which was mine, I guess. But... Um, not really. I mean, he gave me hope when there was absolutely none. And even if I was deeply suspicious, um, sometimes I think that con men, they're strange people. They will cheat you in the end, but sometimes if they like you, they won't cheat you straight away. And that was my gamble, that he preferred to cheat me outside than inside. Yeah. Um, yeah, we go. But, um, look, I had to get out of where the drug remand prison was because there was no escaping from there, not a second's privacy. The room, the dormitory I was in, held 164, one hole in the ground sort of toilet down the end with a couple of towels strung over a bit of string for privacy. Um, <laughs> this, the, uh, and Thais are a bit more open-minded, I guess, about some things than probably Westerners are. They, they used to rent out uh, a porno magazine for people using that toilet with 164 people watching them. You have to have a certain amount of focus of mind to concentrate on your filthy magazine, I would expect. That is, and also there were towels tied to the windows and stretched and then thumbtacked to the wooden floor to make little pup tents where the boys used to entertain each other. Escaping wasn't... That was my first sense of how escaping went. It never happened, because four guys had managed to cut out of one of these dormitories. I have no idea how they stopped the trustees in the cell from squealing on them, but they were a very tough Thai street gang. They actually got out of this cell. But that was the beginning of their troubles. They'd all lied to each other about Mm, I've got friends coming, I've got a, a cell phone hidden somewhere, I've got a rope over there, I know the way to the back wall. None of it, none of it, none of it. No rope, no phone, no people. Wandered over in the general direction, couldn't even figure out a way over the first of the six walls they'd have to go through to get to the outer wall. And there's, and there's a moat to think about. They turned themselves in. They had to wake up the prison guard on duty that night, who was horrified. He was outraged that after all the good things he does for prisoners, on his shift, that they choose to go. That he let them um, get up to their little bits of mischief and gamble at night. Oh, he took some money for it, but he deserved that because he was being such a nice guy. Why shouldn't they reward him? We shouldn't apply what the Western standard of what a bribe is when it comes to there. But in Asia, and particularly in Thailand, it's not like that. They feel that they're just being rewarded for um, doing nice things for, for the prisoners. Um, and they're entitled to that. Because everything's luck. Uh, 
massive gamblers. It's out right there, but they are. And amongst the the inmates, there were lucky ones and, and ones who were not lucky and poor. It wasn't so much a matter of one is cleverer than the other. They just thought everything was luck. They thought the whole rich West was because of luck. Uh, that Thailand was the centre of the world. and So when these guys turned themselves in, uh, wanted to escape. I mean, they didn't... The officials in the jail didn't mind any amount of mischief you got up to. You could get away with the murder if you wanted. But uh, that was kept within family. So they were outraged. These guys were chucked in what they call the soy. It means the street, of course. I suppose it goes back to the old days when people were chained to the ground in the street and just left there as a jail punishment. But um, they were put in these half-sized coat lockers, a little letterbox slit in there, given a, a bottle of water a day and a, a bowl of rice and a paint tin, which was their bathroom. Um, that was the good stuff. The bad thing was that every day, a couple of times a day, they'd be, or even the trustees were sent downstairs while upstairs where these guys were in these lockers had been dragged out. You could hear the track, the heavy elephant chains that they'd been put into clanking over the steel of the edge of the locker as they were pulled out and then a variety of canes and sticks whacked into them, piteous, wailing, high-pitched squeals of pleading and pain, and then it'd go silent, and you'd just hear the thwumps and the whacks as though somebody was hitting a carcass with an axe handle or something. Well, they didn't survive that, of course. They were all dead within uh, about four or five weeks. I. This didn't put you off, the idea of escaping, or you were as good as dead if you stayed in there, you thought? So. Well, I knew that um, at a certain point uh, I'd be sentenced to death and I'd be on death row for a while. Whether I'd be executed or not didn't really bother me so much because, it, as I say, it was machine gun, so it wouldn't be much. But I just couldn't accept the idea of spending years on appeals and which would go nowhere, and ultimately the rest of my miserable existence in, in this prison. And a policeman had even visited me to stress that point, that I have 20 years in there, and even if, even if I managed to survive it, they would be waiting when I got out. So even for that small amount that they would scraped together at the airport, you believed you, it was going to definitely still be that sentence, there's no way of good lawyers or any way to... No, uh, my lawyer said... Uh, Look, um, I said, but the defence case is that, he said, you know what, here we call the defence case, it's called the dream. Um, you are never found not guilty. It doesn't happen. It has happened in a case where there's six people and they want somebody to look like uh, actually courts mean something, they might let one go every so often. It has happened. But it's so exceptional that people talk about it for years. Um, there was an Englishman who was in there, Martin. Um, he was accused of being the translator for a Canadian drug syndicate. The evidence against him was a grainy photocopy of a photograph of some people at an outdoor cafe somewhere. And that was produced in court. And the way of the court works is the judge reads into a tape recorder his impressions of the evidence. That gets typed up, everybody signs it. And that is the case. And he gets the photograph. And despite the lawyer saying, oh, to the officer who introduced it, were you on the case? No. What about these Canadians? Oh, they disappeared. And were any drugs found? I don't know, but there were drugs involved, and he produced another photograph of a picture of a pile of drugs, or packets of something. Cornflakes, who knows what it was. Now, uh, uh, Martin told me that the judge read that 
image into the evidence as. Yes, the photograph clearly shows the accused translating for the drug syndicate. <laughs> so, he was given 50 years. So, uh, so the levels of that evidence, they've got slightly different levels of evidence in this country. Somewhat. Uh, I had uh, a newspaper story uh, from um, uh, a Melbourne tabloid which involved two policemen speculating on what uh, I might have been doing and where that would have been leading to and oh, he was one of the biggest in his day and we're sure that he would have been putting together another set of uh, couriers and things like that. So that was read into evidence. Um, and how? Picking a prosecution hands over a piece of paper from him. No, they, and they, they make it solid by bringing in a translator from the university and she translated the story from English into Thai. And the judge turned to my lawyer, who was trying to throw doubt on this, by saying, look, it's only a conversation between two policemen, there's no evidence in it. And the judge said, but this woman is from the university. Well, what do you think, she's lying? No, it's the... Uh, and sits down. And he turned to me and said, you see, the dream. <laughs> The requirements to become a judge are slightly lower than this country as well. We yes, you, you get your dad to pay for your position and that's it. You get to wear the clothes. There was no, there was no, no going to be winning in any courtroom. But I had, I made sure I, I needed to get into a more cash economy area of the prison and get some idea of what the place looked like. Um, it was, they had a, where I was, because there was no cash there, he used a kind of a, a token system, which was little packets of tanjai, it was a, aspirin powders. Um, why? Because they were small, could be bunched together, had a set exchange rate to the baht. Uh, I think there were th 30 of them. Oh no, there were about one baht each. And it was a, such a well-arranged central bank of tanjai, aspirin packet powders, that they were able to <clears throat> keep these in circulation because it cost something to buy them. So it wasn't like printing money, you had to pay something to get them. And that's what a lot of countries don't <clears throat> realize, like uh, uh, the old Weimar Republic just printed money. You can't do it, it has to be based on something. And that the, the bankers there used to ceremonially get the big donut wok, a three foot what that would cook the morning donuts in oil, which was another sideline business. Um, the guards got a cut of, of course. And they'd fill that with water and boil away the old tamjai packets because they were falling to pieces and then reintroduce new banknotes for within there. And this money earned its keep. At the end of the day's trading from all the little sellers who had rolled out towels and their business might be rolling cigarettes or uh, fixing old uh, cigarette lighters by putting a new flint in them. Everybody had a little trade. <clears throat> and though the main one was drawing pictures on, on shell backgrounds for sale to the public, and the guards used to be in that, they did quite well. But um, it could be cruel. There would be the laziest worker of the factory each day. He would be beaten. Now... Somebody well. is going to be the laziest, isn't he? Yeah. Um, there's a, a, the worst workers. It's a good, are, good way, to, way to motivate your work, so. Yes, yeah. Not only that, uh, as they were at each blow of the cane on their back, they'd have to say something back to the guard administering it. Guards couldn't be bothered most of the time, they'd get the trustees to do it. But the one being punished would have to turn to the guard and say, Thank you, sir, for correcting me after each strike of the cane. Now, I had to go someplace better, so I paid 25,000 baht and went to the main prison. And I liked it. So I, I, how it. much, how much 25,000 baht in terms okay, of... Okay, divide it by about 100 to get pounds. So, um, that's a 250 pounds. Okay. Um, and that was, that was quite a lot. Um, but I wasn't supposed to be there because I was still on remand. I should have been staying where I was, but that was just an impossible kind of place. <clears throat> I arrived in uh, Building 6, 
which held about 900 people. And they have a little welcoming night there too. Everybody who arrives each day, they all get jammed into a cell with a non-functioning fan. 34 to 40 people in a eight-man cell, just jammed in there, feet in your face, people squashed up, hunched on the wall, you can't actually sleep, steamingly hot. Bed bugs go berserk in there, crawling out of the rotten wooden floors, biting you all the time. Uh, Swiss Freddy used to squash his on the wall so he could make a, a blood sort of Banksy drawing out of something there. Everybody would steam out of that cell in the morning and go and see the trustees and say, all right, what do I do to you know, do better? So I uh, teamed up with uh, an English guy, uh, Nick from Patia, who was in a 10 kilos of uh, marijuana charge. Um, he was, he must have been greedy in a way because there was no policeman being brought off down in Patia when he was serving up his weed. And even though it was only to other expats, they, when they found out about it, they dropped a hint, but he wouldn't play along, so he got arrested. He wasn't in there forever. He had a Thai wife and things could be fixed. Actually, he got um, a sentence which allowed him to be paroled out. It was the only European I've ever seen on parole there. He came to visit us afterwards. He walked through the main gate and came down to a building, gave me a couple of cartons of cigarettes, and, and so assured I gave him one of my credit cards as he left because he didn't have the money for the, to buy his way out of the immigration detention centre. So you still had your wallet and all your credit cards on you in there? No, you? I had them, I had nothing. So, I mean, I had some money, cash hidden, but that was long gone. I had I, um, found out um, when I went to the, the bigger section, the main prison, how that worked. It was a real hive of industry, factories there. Some made umbrellas, others army boots. And there was a coffee shop, which was a general store that not only sold dry goods, but had a banking window around the corner where you could get cash from your account for a 25% cut on it. So you could sign out for 1250 and they'd take the 250 and give you the 1000 And you'd need that just for routine things. But I bypassed that by having two visa cards sent to the building guard who controlled who was in the building. And I'd already... Um, arranged uh, a few hundred pounds to buy a cell. That is, a uh, cell was cleared. <laughs> I can imagine some people swept out of there, and you know, 10 or 15 of them. It was a wreck anyway. I had to put in a new fan, get lino put down, had a, where the hole in the floor for the toilet was in the corner, I had that bricked up and made into a kind of shower cubicle. Um, hired myself a couple of servants, and uh, they, the head one, his, his name was Jet, because he was, Jet is seven in Thai, and he was the seventh son, and he was only about four and a half foot tall, but like any good head butler, he used to boss the staff around. You don't see many tall tires, do you? No, and he shouldn't have got onto a bus and started waving a gun around to try and rob the passengers at that height. They all just picked him up off the bus and dropped him off at the next corner where there was a policeman. Um, but he, so I thought, no, I have to appear like I'm settling in. Normally people didn't stay in this first building six. They got sent on to, oh, don't you want to go where the foreigners are? No, I do not. <laughs> you can imagine they, they'd have their eye on those foreigners because they don't know the Thai ways. They, they get up to some perhaps serious mischief that, they don't pay for. <laughs> and were you picking up uh, the Thai language at these times, David, or could everyone talk English? Uh, no, they weren't particularly good at it. Uh, I mean, the, only a few did. And the guards, some of them spoke a few words, but the guards I kind of liked um, for their corruptibility. They didn't speak any English, but I, I, I learnt enough. And anyway, um, what is it? A lot of smiles, and I brought my... Um, uh, manservant over, and he'd do the translating. And you know, I had to say, Jet, 
don't add anything to what I say. You know, don't think it would be better if it sounds like this or that. You know, just say, pleased to meet you. Love the way you run this art factory over here. I see. Perhaps is there a corner over there I could use for a desk? You know, I I uh, like to draw pictures myself. I know it's going to cause you a lot of trouble, but look, I can see there's some things need to be done around here. That lighting's not very good. Look, take some money and get that done, and then we'll go. So um, before you knew it, I had um, a kind of office down in one of the buildings. I got Noel, who was a Frenchman from uh, uh, the Atlantic side. He was a pretty good cook and a big Sten from Sweden and uh, a couple of others. So there was about six of us in, um, in this little room and we played a lot of Scrabble. Um, they didn't allow gambling game boards but they, the Scrabble was okay. We had our own rules, you know. Um, it's a bit like the joke about people in prison have heard the joke so often they give them numbers, you know, and somebody yells out 43 and nobody laughs. It was because of the way he said it, you know. Um, we had our own rules for Scrabble, such as, um, you know, how you have two blanks. You could put down a letter upside down and you could challenge each other as to whether it was really a blank or it was actually the letter you nominated and make side bets on that. It, uh, if you're long enough doing the same things, you dream up new rules for it. But my own personal goal in all of it was looking at everything for potential for escape. Uh, it was going quite well, but out of... I guess I... I, I was offered more stability. I had a, um, a Chinese Laotian Thai friend there who was um he was a trustee but he wasn't a bad one he wasn't he wasn't associated or tied to any particular prison guard but charlie he would take me around the prison i could have a look at other sections i did and i was wise not to go to the foreigners building number four because they had the heaviest bars you can imagine there'd be no cutting through those i had a bit of experience with escapes because i was there and in on the night that um, the five guys got out of the Supermax prison in Australia. So I knew, really, if it's worked out, everything can be done. Um, and, and I found uh, over my prison time that mostly with escapes is the will to do it, to actually go and do it. Uh, if you can get to that wall and you have a way over it, the probability is you, you'll get over it because people aren't watching all the time. But still, I didn't really know my way around it. I looked at the other buildings. This was kind of far away from the outer wall. But I didn't have really a good mental map of the place. Even so, I could look at from the bus on the to and from court. It would drive over the 20-yard moat as it left the complex, but I didn't really know where that and what it was on the side. I had some visitors come and attempted to get them to describe the thing, but they could never really do it very well. But I knew even from my third floor window, uh, by the way, they used to put the foreigners high up. They didn't light them on the ground floor. They thought that was a bit tempting. They might try and get out. The Thais had never considered, well, really consider such a thing. But um, it, it did look like I was very settled there. I got along. I didn't get involved in any things that were too much like a dependent business. This the general store came up for sale. That would have been about £6,000 to buy out. It was highly profitable. It had two restaurants, you could call them that, attached to it at the side. It had a barber shop that was part of it, and a lending library, um, which people paid fees for. My goodness, a proper a little enterprise. It, this it was, thing. yeah. So you could have survived sort of half yeah. decently in there. Charlie this. said, "Look, I'll, I'll come to see you all the time, David. We'll keep paying, and 
And even if you run out of money, uh, I'll have a bit because I'm out. I mean, he was a really nice guy. I knew I could trust him. <clears throat> um, well, I felt I could. And, but it was too much. It was, I was 39 or something by then. Um, and I'd, I'd been through too much. I just didn't want any more of it. Anyway, I, by then I was in the mode that I was when I was smuggling borders. It was another thing that needed to be worked out, that it could be done. So I started assembling various things that I'd need. Plans that involved trusting anybody else were no good. I would be... The, the ties would be little chatterboxes, and even if they didn't mean it, they'd tell their best friend, oh, you know, he, he wants to get out, we're going to take him to the auto repair shop and we're going to hide him in one of the vans that's ready for collection to be taken out. You can imagine the places where that would go wrong. I don't really fancy the idea of being welded into a steel van anyway. Uh, secondly, I, I kind of knew as time went on and people were backing out that I would be alone. So it would be old school escape over the wall by some means. Um, and that was made particularly so when the last guy that was going to go with me, Sten the Viking, he, oh, there was another one, Swiss, another Swiss guy, Theo, but he died in our cell. Uh, we couldn't get him medical treatment. It started with some nonsense. He was blowing his nose too strongly and kind of did a double sneeze and must have burst a blood vessel inside there. He had a headache, wouldn't eat that night, uh, wouldn't go anywhere. We, the doctor said, oh, there's nothing I can do. Even the one we bribed to come and take a look at him. And I went up to the cell the next day and saw him and kind of rolled him over a bit and I knew he was in trouble. One eye was like, um, what would you call it, like opal, all clouded over. And he was all bunched up with one hand that couldn't move. That meant the one side of his brain wasn't working. And with the other hand that had moved, he, he reached it over and started banging his head, saying, it's agony in here, agony. He died overnight, I had to cost two cartons of cigarettes to get the body taken away. Um, Jesus. Yeah, so he was out of it. Um, as time went on, uh, oh, I paid for a light switch. Yeah, nobody else had one. That was expensive. Oh, no, the lights have to be on all the time, they said. Yeah, but I can't sleep. I'm not used to it. You know, it's only, we're all foreigners in there. It's only us. Um, and, but... <laughs> Paid for a new office for him, so uh, that, that took care of that. Uh, anyway, they didn't care. Uh, um, and here was the thing, I, I never told anybody except for um, my Swedish friend. And why did he back out? I needed him really, because he was super strong, he'd been working out. I'm not heavily built, uh, I'm light, that's a good thing. But this meant coming, getting out of the cell in the middle of the night, getting to the ground without making a noise, because it was a cell full of trustees who'd blow their little whistles out if they saw us. Get to the ground, get to my office, get some more equipment, and start heading over these internal walls to get to the outer one, which had electricity running across the top, and it was very tall. And then getting over the moat. Oh, and here's where things go wrong. And here's how we had a very strong lesson in where things go wrong. Um, Sten was a bit nervous about coming with me anyway. <clears throat> he was delaying on giving me his passport photograph, even though I said I'd get a camera and all of that. A couple of guys arrived from Chiang Mai, foreigners. Israelis they were. They'd been on a, they'd been on a drug case up there. That jail up there is, was easy enough to get out of, and they had, but they'd been caught. 
They've been caught because they didn't have a plan for what to do when they got out. And you'll see that in just about every escape you ever read about and hear about. There was a great one from New York State where a couple of lifers got out with no plan that held up for getting away. But, you know, I had one. I wanted passports ready. I wanted money ready in the right place. It didn't have to be a lot, just enough to get moving. The, when these Israeli guys turned up, they'd been caught and sent down to the big secure prison in Bangkok. I said to Stan, look, come round and hear the story. It's an interesting lesson in what to be prepared for, we should know. I didn't really want him to see them, you know, because when they'd been caught, one at a bus stop and the other one at a guest house after he'd been leached of all his money. The Thai guards there had been so outraged, they dragged them into a kind of dungeony place within the prison cells, smashed their legs with iron bars and thrown rocks on top of them. They'd been conscripted, conscripted as most Israeli guys are, and women, I think, into the army there, so they were reasonably tough guys. One dragged himself out agonizingly from the rocks and gave bits of water to the other one that he found. So the Thais were astonished to find them still alive ten days later. And they thought, well, they can live if they want, but their legs, they'd set back. They never got any treatment for it. They, they couldn't, they still had chains on. And that was, I can't imagine what the agony of that would have been. But they were all bent out of place and twisted like some crushed drinking straw by some angry kid at McDonald's or something. Uh, so they'd be hobbling around like that. Now when my Swedish friend saw that, he he backed out. He made his excuses. He, he said he would, had nowhere to go and what would he do and... He, he knew he would be caught somewhere, somehow. So he was going to stay and get transferred back, which was an option for prisoners who would uh, plead guilty and get some sentence less than death. Even on a life sentence, after eight, ten years, they can be transferred back. Still, that, was, that kind of thing never interested me, but that was his excuse, and I was on my own. But. I think considering all the other crazy schemes, including one to when Theo was still alive, we were going to go out dressed up as United Nations Medical Emergency Services or something with a stretcher taking one of us out, figuring that the uniforms and the craziness of it, the guards had just opened all the doors because we looked so official. Um, it, it wouldn't have worked, but it was a funny thing to think about. But my lawyer told me that my case would come to an end, I'd be found guilty, they were going to make an example of a foreigner, and I would be sentenced to death. It might not be carried out, but they'd certainly go to the very wire on that one. <clears throat> so I had only a couple of weeks to get out of the place, and two years or so had passed. Um, I'd learnt a lot in there, of course, about even more about people, but um, there just came a point when uh, I think it's like an alcoholic who decides to stop drinking, you come to a point, it has to be now or never. Um, I looked out of the window that night and the guard that I particularly didn't want to be asleep under the window, he wasn't on duty, it was an overcast night, other things were favourable. I was, it was getting close to midnight. There was only four or five of us, I think, in the cell. Yeah, five. By that time, it was time to go. 